and uh, I have a little surprise for you. Uh, come on. Uh, Bill has uh, purchased the L3 and he's painting it up like uh, the L4s that we had for the invasion of uh, D-Day. And uh, he's having a little problem with, with it, but uh, he's going to get it done. And uh, I want him to have the correct wings to wear. afternoon and I was looking for the wings for a recon pilot <laughs> and I saw a blank spot on the display stand and I asked the woman behind the counter and she said oh we just sold those a couple minutes ago <laughs> thank you so much it's an honor thank you Wow, that is so cool. I said, well, we can order it for you, but it will take a month or two. So, this goes on my cap. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll tell you right up front, um, I've done a lot of public speaking in my days, and this one has had me the most nervous because um, I'm just so honored to be, be with all of you tonight. Um, I can't even begin to express my feelings uh, about sharing the last couple of days with you and the friends I've found here. Um, I would start by saying General Bennett is my friend. And when I was first writing down what I was going to say, I, I put him in the past tense as no, no, General Bennett is my friend. And he has stood for me as a his second father. I had the honor of meeting him just about seven years ago. And the distinct honor of, I jokingly say, being his Boswell, where for Sundays across three years, I would sit, and we had a regular ritual, we would meet at 1,400 hours, and I better be at the door at 1,400 hours, and we would just talk, and for three hours, I would just sit and type and listen, and across three years, I gradually learned your story. And that's why I'm so honored to be here tonight, because we focus so much on you. Now, I just, I've, I've had a, a fabulous time. It's not only sharing time with you, but the, the experience. Luke, thank you so much for, for all your arrangements you made here on the base. Yesterday was a fabulous experience yes. of uh, visiting my hand to you. You just did. <laughs> and I, I want to start off by making a comment about that, and that we all had the experience the last two days of seeing the the incredible proud young men and women who are at this very moment defending our freedoms. It was a point to me that when I got a chance to talk to them uh, before I left, I didn't say thank you for myself. I drew out a photograph of my 14-year-old daughter and I would show them the, fo the photo of my girl Megan. I say, she sleeps safe tonight because of you. Now, I recently read an article about the youth of America. And the article was entitled, Can Americans Fight? And this article went on to talk about that issue, and I thought about that a lot as I was going around this space the last two days. And it's, the article was very, very negative about American youth. <laughs> it said our opponents that we face come from dictatorships. They are used to violence. They are trained to violence since childhood. They are trained in fanaticism. American youth does not have the stuff. American youth is addled on uh, the sick music that they listen to today. They're so lazy that they'd rather drive a car 200 miles down to the local store than walk it. They're too busy chasing each other. Well, we'll sort of PG it because it's a young lady here. But you know what I mean. And the article went on to be very negative about American youth and concluded with uh, a negative conclusion. Our youth just does not have it. And in the conflict, we're in very deep trouble. There's one little caveat to all that. The article was written in 1939. Wow. 
It was about you, the greatest generation. It was about you. And yet on December 7th, 1941, you rose up in your righteous anger. And less than three years and ten months later, well, first at Berlin in May of that year, and then in Tokyo Bay, you showed the world what Americans can do. One of the great stories about the end of the war in Tokyo Bay was that when the surrender was signed, I wish somebody had caught it on film, after the last signature by the Japanese was put on, Bill Halsey turned to his air boss and said, okay, bring them in. And they said it was an aluminum overcast of a thousand American planes flying at mass top level across the harbor just to convey the message. This is what you do when you get American angry. This is what we can respond. That's what you, the greatest generation, did. And I think that applies to the greatest generation of today. The looking into the eyes of the young men and women we saw yesterday. They're the greatest generation today. Don't forget it. But that, I, always love, I always love reading that to my students because they think, oh, gosh, she's talking about us. I say, that was written in 1939, and it was projecting we would lose if we ever went up against the Nazis. In 1450, I'm a history teacher, so I've got to throw this in. There's a very famous battle that some history, how many are history buffs here, okay? How many like Shakespeare? <laughs> 1415, a very small British force was, was pinned against the Somme River. They were outnumbered about 10 to 1. It looked like they were going to go down to defeat. And the French uh, made a very sarcastic offer of, of surrender, to which King Henry V refused. And the following morning at Agincourt, a small band of soldiers of 8,000 foot infantry faced 40,000 French knights and defeated them with the longbow, the new high technology weapon of its day. It was the M7 of its day. <laughs> and the French learned, you don't charge against that. Shakespeare would write a very famous play about this 100 years later. It's, it is my favorite. It's uh, Henry V. And the most famous line in that is in the act where the Battle of Agincourt takes place. Some soldiers are standing around and they're saying, boy, we're going to get our asses kicked. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, we're going to get our backsides kicked. And uh, they're lamenting him, and one man says, oh, if we had but one ten thousand more, the men in England who are asleep this day. And at that moment, Henry V, the king, walks in, and he says, you know, who's he who wishes so? Ah, cuz, ask not, for not one man more. For the fewer men, the greater share of honor. And then the very famous line in that, in that play is, when he is rousing his men to battle, the famous line is, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he who sheds his blood with me this day shall be my brother. You are the band of brothers. You had your St. Crispin's Day. That was the day that the battle was fought, St. Crispin's Day, October 25th, 1415. And I, I look at the gentleman here, I think of the names that were just read off. You are the blessed band of brothers. And the other line from the play says, And yearly on the vigil, you will roll your sleeves and bear your scars and say, These wounds I won on Crispin's day. And gentlemen in England now abed shall hold themselves, hold themselves accursed. They were not here upon St. Crispin's day. So I salute you as the warriors of St. Crispin's day. You stood against incredible odds. And we have to look back to 1941 and 42. It's hard for me to convey to my students today, I mean, this is, I'm sorry to say, ancient history to some of them. And it's a foregone conclusion. We talk about World War II, well, we won. And very few people can connect back to the days you met, remembered, in 1940, 41, 42, when the Nazis had overrun country after country after country, when the Russians lost three quarters of a million men in one battle in August of 1941, when the Japanese destroyed our fleet and destroyed our army in the Philippines in a matter of weeks, we did not know if we were going to win or not. There was a good chance we could have lost, but then you stood up. 
there's a famous interview with a German survivor of Omaha Beach. And he was asked, how did you know when you were going to lose? And he said, well, when the first, came, first wave came in, we shot them down. And then the second wave came, and then the third wave, and the fourth wave. And they didn't stop coming. They just kept coming. And then I knew, my God, we are going to lose. That was your St. Christmas Day. And you had 424 of them. I was awed by that shirt. By the way, thank you very much for the present. I'm honored to be able to wear that shirt. I want to talk about Don just for a couple minutes. The general, as his son-in-law always reminds me, and he always will be sir to me. Um, he was my friend. He was my second father. I met him through random chance years ago when a friend of a friend brought him into my World War II class at my college one evening. And I was so awed just talking with him. Later that evening, I was talking with one of my editors, and he said, you've got to grab this guy and sit down with him. But I had to get through one major barrier. And many of you might recall General Bennett's lovely wife, Betts. Uh, apparently, there have been some problems years early with the Army historians not getting the story right. And I went to sit down with the General about, sir, I think there's a book in you. And I can still remember Betts interrogating me very carefully. It was like, young man, are you going to take my husband down a road again? Because I'm not going to tolerate it. <laughs> and she finally gave permission for us to go ahead. I'm going to share a couple of very personal stories. And forgive me if I start to lose it, OK? We've been working on the book for about five months. And the general's beloved wife was failing. And I had an appointment to meet with him the next day to keep working. And the way we worked was, as I said, I'd show up in 1,400 hours. We'd sit, we'd talk for three hours. We always went to Applebee's afterwards, had the identical meal, the identical food, and then continue on. And then I got a phone call from my mom. And she was sobbing. And she said, and she, you've got to come now. Dad's in the hospital. You just have a rush call away. And it was 663 miles from my house to my parents' house, and I was on the road within the hour. And I'm calling frantically all the way up, and I wasn't sure if Dave was going to pull through. Well, I called the general to cancel my appointment the next day, and Betts answered the phone. She was failing. I had just sent her the day before. She was a beautiful gardener, and I had sent her a potted plant. And I said to her, uh, Betts, uh, I explained the situation to her. I said, please tell uh, your husband I won't be able to make it tomorrow. This is a situation. My dad's in the hospital. It's critical. I said, I'll be back next week, and things should work out, I pray, and then we'll plant those flowers. And she very calmly said to me, Bill, I won't be here when you get back. And I, said, I started throwing up. I said, come on, Betts. And she said, Bill, it's, it's my time. She was having respiratory failure. And I choked up, and then she said, just do me one favor. After I'm God, keep Don busy with the book. Well, I was up in Jersey for the week, and every day the general called. How's your dad? How's your mom? How are you? I'm praying for you. And he never met my father, nor my mother. We had just known each other for several months. And my dad, tough, and by, by the way, my dad was stationed here before the war. He was horse cow when they still had the horses. So this was a sentimental journey for me as well. That's why I choked up last night when sentimental journey started playing. I was thinking my dad as well. Dad, tough old cavalry sergeant that he was, pulled through. I'm driving home. I just crossed into North Carolina, and my phone rings. And it's the general. And I instantly knew. And right away, I started to say, sir, what's happening? And this is exactly what he said. Very calm voice. He said, Bill, how's your dad today? I said, sir, he's, he's fine. He's out of the hospital. He's in a recovery facility. He'll be home in about three weeks. And he, and he, he said, good. But he said, I'm great. Bill, how's your mom? I said, mom's tough. And mom's pretty good. And then it was like, well, how are you doing? Are you driving safe? Are you being careful? And at that point, I'm in tears. I said, yes, sir. What's, what happened? Only then did he say, that's passed away an hour ago. He 
always thought of everyone other than himself. Always thought of everyone other than himself. He never met my father. My father passed away. At that point, the general was living uh, with uh, his daughter, who they were about 120 miles from where I live. And the funeral service for my father was about to begin. And we had my father's saber up by his urn. And then who walked in but four-star general? He came all that distance to salute a sergeant he had never met, but was the father of a friend. To me, it was one of the greatest honors I've ever had that when he approached my father's urn, he came to attention and saluted. And I kept thinking, my old man, you know those family circle cartoons where the grandparents were up in heaven looking down? And I knew my father was up there with his comrades at this, that moment. says, how many of you guys have ever been saluted by a four-star general? Whatever the general spoke of you, the men of the 62nd, he did so with pride. When I tried to focus in on things that he might have done, all I ever heard was a litany over and over again. It was, no, no, Phil, you're getting it wrong. It was the men. It was them. It was they who did it. It wasn't me. It was they who did it. And the love that he had for you came from the depths of his heart. And I know that because I did spend three years with him every Sunday. And we would go over the same thing eight, nine, ten times to make sure we got it right. And yet always it came back to you, how proud he was of you. Paul might not have been with you, but I remember once asked, talking to him about fear. And i got to throw this in. I, I asked him why. I said, sir, were there moments when you really were frightened? And, you know, remember, those of you who knew him well, he had a very gentle voice. He said, well, he said, I'll tell you about the time I was about most frightened. I wanted to see what it was like to be an F.O. up on one of those darn planes. I said, that guy took me up, and he was flying under the telephone wires, going <laughs> sideways around trees, and he was shouting rude things at the crowds to try and get him to shoot so he could call in a shot. He said, by the time we got back on the ground, I swore I'd never go up one of those things again as far as I did. That's what I was afraid. Said, Paul, I don't know if you remember if it was you or not who gave him the thrill ride of a lifetime. I'm going to read something from the book, Honor Untarnished, which is General Bennett's book. As I said, all I was was his Boswell. My greatest honor in life was simply, I got to write it down. But this is his book and his words. And I read this again as I was flying out here. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to death to face you guys. I mean, what, what can I say to you? I'm just a writer. I'm a guy who sits in a corner punches keys. You were the man who went out there and did it. And what can I say to you? Well, I want you to hear General Bennett's words of what he said about you. Take a deep breath. And by the way, in all the times I interviewed with him, there were maybe half a dozen times where he broke and wept. When he told me this story, he wept. We had crossed into Holland around the 10th of September, facing sporadic resistance. The countryside flat, open, dotted with small towns and villages, some of which were burning, plumes of smoke rising in the distance. We were at the forward edge of the advance, a long, sinuous column of troops, tanks, vehicles stretching behind us all the way back to the horizon. Our column stopped for a moment, the forward recon units racing ahead of us, probing. On the road beside us was a small home, typical of the Dutch, well organized and neat. The front door cracked open. A middle-aged man looked out at us, wide-eyed. Hesitantly, he came out and he approached me. Are you Americans? He asked nervously. Smiling, I nodded. Are you here to stay? Proudly, I pointed back behind me. The entire American army is coming this way. We're here to stay. Tears were in his eyes as he turned and ran back to the house. I didn't take any further notice of him as we waited for orders to press forward, my men taking a break for a few minutes, wolfing down some rations or grabbing a quick smoke. The door to the house opened again, and the man and his wife stood there. Gathered around them were several gaunt children and another couple who were pale, almost ghostly white. 
It was obvious they were frightened as the Dutch couple gently led them out into the sunlight. The youngest child was maybe three or four years old, and she looked up at the sky in wonder. All of us fell silent, looking at them. The Dutch couple approached me, leading their companions. I had a gut sense of what I was witnessing, but still wasn't sinking in. The pale, fragile-looking child and children clung to their parents, and the Dutchman approached me. And then he looked back at his frightened friends. They're Jews, he said. We've been hiding them in our attic since 1940. As my comrades and I, Make eye contact with me, Lynn. Okay. You know, I said a little prayer with a friend just before this, and I, I said, if I hit a moment like this, Don, just do me a favor, put your hand on my shoulder, and then I'll get through it. As my comrades and I looked at those frightened children, the youngest obviously standing beneath the sun and looking at the open sky for the first time, all that we had endured all that we had been fighting for came into focus. I think every one of my men saw their own children standing there, their own families caught in this universe of suffering created by a monstrous cult gone mad. Many of my men, hardened as they were, filled with tears. And they, then they did something wondrous, something so American, something that I will always believe to find who and what we are as a nation and as a people. The men around me began to reach into their pockets. Some drew out packs of gum, others money, K rations, candy, cigarettes that could be used for barter, anything and everything. A pile of offerings were laid before the sufferers. They stood there, still clutching each other, the parents nodding their thanks. But the children were gazing at us in confusion, for after all, were not soldiers someone to fear? Orders came over the radio for us to mount up and move forward. My men scrambled back to their vehicles, engines roared to life, the thunder of our might echoing across the open fields. That family stood there, the simple gifts of gum, food, and cigarettes, a treasure trove in a world of starvation. Their life and freedom, a gift we had brought to their doorstep. We rolled forward, leaving them there. The face of that young child has haunted me ever since for she is the true face of war and all the brutality it can bring when evil is allowed to flourish. I've often prayed for her across the years, hoping that the trauma of her childhood would be left behind, that she would grow strong and live her life in happiness. She must be over 60 years old now, and perhaps she has grandchildren who will never know all that she endured, and which I am grateful for. If ever there was a moment when I was proud to be an American that was there on that road to Holland, the strength of America was behind me, all the way back to the coast of France, a relentless tidal wave that could not be stopped. And never again did any of us doubt what it was that we were fighting for, and we would continue to do so until final victory. That's what he said that year, because you were the ones who bought that freedom. On the day I met General Bennett, I went to his house. My specialty when I was in grad school, grad school is simply nothing more than an act of craziness where you sit for five years. <laughs> I had a wonderful mentor, though. He was German-Jewish, and he was a British commando. Fled the Nazis and, and fought. And I learned so much from him. But my specialty was more the American Civil War at that time. And, and I understood Civil War tactics. I understand how a Civil War regiment would go into battle shoulder to shoulder, how a colonel would advance with his regiment, how a colonel with the sweep of his eyes could see his battle line, say at Gettysburg. And he knew that he was anchored on a regiment to the left and a regiment to the right. And he could take it all in and command it. I never quite understood how a colonel commanded a unit in combat in World War II until I met the general. 
And so that first day we were sitting in his office drinking coffee. And I raised the question to him. I said, sir, I, I put it that way. I said, sir, I understand command and control in the Civil War. Now, I've heard about what you did on Omaha Beach that day. I don't understand how you did it. How did you do it? And all that chaos across the front of 400 yards of Fox Green, how did you do it? And this is exactly what he did in reply. He smiled at me, he reached into his desk, and he pulled out a printed copy, and he said, read this. It was the cadet prayer from West Point. He told me that when he was on the beach that morning, he thought of the prayer that he had first learned at West Point. And he said it to himself. And he said at that moment, he knew what he had to do. And what he had to do was stand up. And that's what you had to do, and that's what so many of you did, you stood up. And then he told me, he said, Bill, that guided my life, the cadet prayer. And he said, every night, when we bed it down, when the nights I could get some sleep, before I went to sleep, I said the cadet prayer to myself. And that gave me the strength to go forward. On the day General Bennett was buried, we were in the chapel where he had first learned that prayer. The most profound experience perhaps in my, and it's not perhaps, it is the most profound experience of my life related to anything with history. The chaplain doing the service read the cadet prayer to us at the end of the service. This was his guidepost. And looking at you gentlemen who I've gotten, had the honor of meeting over these last couple of days, I know this is your guidepost as well. I pray it's the guidepost for all generations in uniform to come. And I'd like to read that prayer to you in closing. This prayer is also in honor of all your comrades who are not with us anymore. This is the cadet prayer of West Point. Back from the book, the last page is, it is to the point I shall return and when I, where I shall rest with bets by my side. Nearby will be the chapel where long ago I first heard the words that shaped my life. The cadet prayer. O oh God, our Father, thou searcher of human hearts, help us to draw near to thee in sincerity and truth. May our religion be filled with gladness, and may our worship of thee be natural. Strengthen and increase our admiration for honest dealing and clean thinking, and suffer not our hatred of hypocrisy and pretense ever to diminish. Encourage us in our endeavor to live above the common level of life, Make us to choose the harder right instead of the easier wrong, and never to be content with a half-truth when the whole truth can be won. Endow us with courage that is born of loyalty that is to all that is noble and worthy, that scorns to compromise with vice and injustice, and knows no fear when truth and right are in jeopardy. Guide us against flippancy and irreverence and the sacred things of life. Grant us new ties of friendship and new opportunities of service. Kindle our hearts in fellowship with those of a cheerful countenance and soften our hearts with sympathy for those who sorrow and suffer. Help us to maintain the honor of the core untarnished and unsullied and to show forth in our lives the ideals of West Point, let me add in here, and of the 62nd Battalion, and doing our duty to thee and to our country, all of which we ask in the name of the great friend and master of all, amen. And then he closes his book with, as long as those words are spoken, acted upon, and believed in, I know that all of our sacrifices and those who sleep the eternal sleep will not have been in vain. May God bless all of you. May God bless the 62nd. May God forever bless these United States of America.
is for John Harrington.